But we're turning next to another major strength of our department, uh, which is imaging. And we're going to talk uh, uh, or have data presented uh, as it relates to eating disorders, amphetamine use disorders, and cannabis. Uh, but uh, uh, fMRI is being used in a wide range of things. Uh, this area also shows the wonders and, uh, of this department regarding collegiality uh, because uh, it has become the people who are expert in uh, fMRI uh, have been so generous with their time in helping the rest of us as we're doing research where fMRI might be uh, useful. Our first lecturer... Uh, uh, for the uh, first uh, presentation this afternoon uh, is uh, Walter Kay. And uh, we were so lucky to have Walter Kay join us. Uh, he came to us from Pittsburgh. He's one, as, with, as is Jay Geed, as he's going to talk briefly about, of uh, Lou Judd's persistence and good judgment uh, regarding once you find somebody who is wonderful and will match well here to uh, do what you can to make sure that they can come. Uh, Walter is a professor of psychiatry. He's the founder and executive director of the UCSD Eating Disorders Research and uh, Treatment Program. When Walt came, he said, uh, at least this was my perception, we're going to have a program it's going to pay for itself, and we're going to do great research. Most of us who have been at UCSD involved with clinical programs said, I'm sure it'll have beautiful research, and we'll try and help you when it's in the red every year. Uh, and indeed, it was never in the red. It is a highly successful program clinically, uh, fiscally, as well as, as in research. And uh, his research is on the relationship uh, between the brain and behavior using imaging and uh, uh, with a special expertise in anorexia nervosa. Glad you can be here. Walter Kay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate being invited. I guess I should say that I have the dubious distinction of being kind of the uh, uh, longest recruit that Lou ever made. You know, I think he started more than 30 years ago, and of course, after I got here, I went like, what was wrong? I, why didn't I do this 20 years ago? So I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I'm going to talk about the question about whether anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder. And that seems like a strange title, but this is a disorder uh, where there's been all kinds of uh, kind of hypotheses about what causes this disorder, but actually very little in terms of looking at appetite regulation. So arguably, this is the most uh, homogeneous of any of the psychiatric disorders. You know, it takes, it's got a similar course. It tends to occur in young women around the age of puberty. Um, and uh, it has a severe eating and restrictive behavior. Uh, you know, the recidivism rate with dieting for most of us is very high for obesity. It's, and I would challenge anybody in this room that doesn't have an eating disorder to eat 500 calories a day of vegetables for the next 10 years. You know, most people can't do that. And the, this is really a critical issue because the, the focus of treatment for people with anorexia is getting them to eat and to gain weight and maintain their weight. And we really don't do a very good job of that. People have body image distortions. They uh, fear of being fat often. This, this tends to be a group of anxious, perfectionistic, obsessive people. Uh, they tend to have these traits premorbidly and persist after recovery. Uh, they're oversensitive to uh, uh, making mistakes, uh, loss, criticism, change. They overexercise. But the other thing that really makes this such a challenging and difficult disease to treat is that people don't see themselves as having a problem and don't want to get better and, don't see, and, and are very resistant to treatment. And consequently, we actually have no proven treatments that reverse core eating disorder symptoms. And this is a chronic disorder for many people. Even the group that gets better, which is about 50%, it's not unusual they're ill for five or 10 years. Uh, there's a group that remains chronically ill, and it's got the highest death rate of any behavioral disorder. 
So in a way, you know, we play, uh, uh, you know, Family Feud, uh, or, the, or these families play Family Feud. Now you know about Family Feud. You know, if you watch, ever watch it on TV, and that uh, what happens is the producers ask, uh, they survey the audience, and they come up with you know proportion of people that have some common kind of response. So let's play Family Feud just like these families do. If you're a healthy person and you go without eating for a couple of days, how do you feel? Most people, most people say they're kind of irritable, tense, uncomfortable. There's something unpleasant about not eating. And, and when you get hungry enough, eating becomes more rewarding. Um, and what happens with people with anorexia? What do you think they say? Well, this is just the opposite. They'll tend to tell you that there's something about eating and food that makes them anxious and they feel better when they don't eat. And this really sets up a conflict with the families because the family, the parents are going like, I don't get it, you know, uh, why won't my child eat? And you see this very anxious girl that's just, you know, terrified and often about eating food. So the challenge, of course, we have is trying to understand how behavior is encoded in the brain and why there's this different response to food, why they lack motivation and insight, why they have difficulty learning and changing. And one of the things that we've learned over the last decade or so is that this is a group of people that tends to be kind of insensitive to reward, but they're, it's not only food, drugs, money, uh, they're, and they're oversensitive to what we might call punishment, which is really some construct of anxiety, harm avoidance, risk, uh, change, uncertainty, uh, repetitive ne negative thinking. And so this gives us some clues in terms of what systems we may want to look at in the brain in terms of, you know, uh, reward and, and systems that are, make us self-aware of body states. Are those involved? And you know, particularly trying to answer this question about whether there's a disturbance of appetite regulation, and that's really what we've used fMRI for. To, the first thing we want to do is just identify what pathway may be involved. And so we've done a series of studies where we've given very simple stimuli, which is just repetitive taste of sucrose. And the reason for doing that is, you know, that is sugar is kind of hardwired into the brain in terms of, uh, uh, you know, being a palatable taste. But also asking the question, is it more than just eating, is there some kind of disturbance of, in general, about salient stimuli and body states. The other thing that we've done, and I'm going to talk mostly about people that recover from anorexia. These are people that are normal weight, they're usually in their 20s, they're not on medication, normal menses. Don't, aren't restricting in, and uh, and the reason that we do that is that when people are malnourished, you can you know we know that these systems are very you know uh, involved and very disturbed, and we want to tease apart kind of trait and state here. And then the other question is, what are the treatment implications? So just you know, we've been very interested in, a, in a kind of a salient stimuli pathway, which is really a pathway that's very, very much involved in responding to the sweet taste of sugar. So very simplistically, if if you uh, you taste sugar, there's a sweet taste receptor in your mouth. You it it, uh, it, it sends a signal up through your thalamus and your brainstem, you know, your brainstem and thalamus into your insula which is very important about self-awareness of body states. There's a, there's a taste cortex in there that says that you've tasted something sweet, and that's integrated with uh, you know, messages about the emotionality and reward of that, as well as homeostatic kind of values. And also, the, uh, uh, the frontal lobes are involved in terms of incentive learning, uh, the amygdala in terms of the effective relevance of this. And then they send a signal into the striatum which is, of course, very important for kind of selecting action and, and carrying out kind of, initi you know, carrying out key, uh, selecting one action and inhibiting others. And so what uh, our earlier studies have shown, and these are two different populations, two different cities, but we found pretty much exactly the same thing. If you do this study on anorexics, what you find is particularly there's a diminished signal in the insula and there's a diminished signal uh, in areas of the striatum. And, uh, and um, you know, this is, this is very interesting. So we really, when we did these original studies, we didn't really clearly ask a question about eating behavior and whether they were hungry or satiated. So we went back and we did a third study, and we really wanted to ask the question about what happens if you're hungry or full. And we know that if you're a human or an animal and you get hungry, this activates reward systems and it uh, reduces top-down inhibition.
And so the question is, what happens to animals have, anorexes have an abnormal response to hunger? So we, we brought people into the CTRI here for three days. These were controls. These were recovered anorexics. On one day, they fasted for 16 hours and had a scan. The other day, they ate normally and had a scan. And we gave them, they had tubes in, the, in their mouth during the scanner. We gave them repeated taste of either sugar or water. And um, the, the major finding was in the left ventral caudal putamen, which is actually part of the limbic striatum. And just as we expected, these are the healthy control women. On the day they were hungry, the signal was significantly higher than on the day they were fed. For the people with anorexia, it was actually very different. That on the day they were hungry, they had a diminished signal. Uh, and actually, on the day they fed, they looked just like the controls. So there was, a, there was a reduction in, in, in limbic kind of striatal response. Uh, we saw ex the same thing at a lower threshold in, in the uh, anterior insula. And when we looked at the connectivity between the, in, the insula and the striatum, we actually found a diminished connectivity in just the same kind of pattern. So it turns out that the anterior insula actually uh, projects along the ventral medial striatum and projects right into the caudal ventral putamen. Um, and this is an area that's very important for mediating and regulating goal-directed behavior, such as the consumption of palatable food. So there's a couple of different interpretations we can make about this. One is, um, if there's a disturbance in the insula, is there some kind of impaired response? Do they fail to sense body state signals or hunger actually, actually accurately integrate that with emotional drives? Um, and the, the disturbance in the insula, in the, in the striatum, would suggest that there's impaired motivation or initiation or, uh, and response when hungry. You know, you know these are, we, we don't know for sure. Now, there was one other very interesting finding, and that is if you look at the uh, dorsal caudate, what we found is a very strong relationship between harm avoidance, which is a measure of anxiety and inhibition and flexibility. It's a, it's a um, TCI measure, and, and the signal in the dorsal caudate. So the more harm avoidant these people were, the more diminished they had a signal there. Uh, and this is, this is also very interesting because we have seen this similar signal now more than five times that if you look at uh, anxiety or uh, harm avoidance in the dorsal caudate, uh, it uh, it's, it's, uh, correlates with re uh, altered dopamine D2 receptor as well as endogenous dopamine and also with other studies that we've done of fMRI tasks as well as white matter uh, microstructure. And there's studies in rodents actually suggesting that risk avoidance in rodents is related to dorsal caudate uh, inhibi uh, inhibition. So, um, you know, the, the take-home message here is there's something about harm avoidance or anxiety that, that uh, is associated with a, a reduced caudate signal. Uh, does anxiety interfere, in, interfere with striatal throughput? Does it impair inhibition uh, or initiation? Um, and, we, you know, we don't know, but, you know, we're beginning to kind of understand why people with anorexia uh, have trouble eating. Now, over the last five years or so, there's been a series of studies actually implicating, you know, the insula and the striatum in, in anorexia that uh, uh, if you show, in ill anorexics, uh, if, uh, looking at, if you show them pictures of food and they're hungry, you see a diminished signal in the insula. Uh, if you, they have altered insula and, and striatal responses, stomach sensations and pain and breathing and touch suggesting this is a generalized kind of phenomenon. Um, or altered dorsal caudate uh, responses are associated with maladaptive food choices, and there's uh, uh, studies showing altered structure and altered connectivity and altered uh, prediction error in, in these systems. And that uh, a study that Christine Weinberger published from our group uh, shows that uh, also immediate re response to immediate re uh, monetary reward is altered in, in the striatum in these people, suggesting that this may be a generalized kind of response. So the take-home message is, um, is there a lack of, uh, of appropriate response to food when hungry? They, these are people that may not be able to translate uh, signals uh, into initiation or motivation to eat. Uh, and, you know, this is a very important system for learning and predicting about learning. And if this system isn't, isn't working right, this may actually 
help us understand why there's a lack of motivation response or there's a lack of learning and starts to open the door to kind of new approaches to treatment. The other question is, does anxiety or inhibition override the influence of hunger? Uh, this is a group of people that have a bias to being more sensitive to kind of reverse stimuli than rewarding stimuli in the world. Um, and, you know, actually, even to take this a little bit further, they may be miscoding food as risky. You know, if you're an animal out there in the wild and you get hungry, you're going to be motivated to go out and look for food. This is what the system's all about. But there's a system in there that if there's something dangerous in your environment, like a predator, you have to be able to inhibit that reward response. And uh, my guess is what's going on with people with anorexia is this, this inhibitory kind of predatory kind of response to danger may be overactive in them, and they're actually getting some, uh, you know, maybe a below conscious signal that there's something about food that's dangerous. So I, I just want to note that one of the things I'm very particularly proud of is, you know, collaborations with, uh, with Christine Weinrega and Amanda Greeth and Alan Simmons and our group who have really been working uh, with us to really take the next generation of treatment forward and get uh, grants um, um, you know, our ones as as well as working with some just very talented fellows that we've had uh, who, are, who are generating uh, grants so that, you know, we're having the resources now to really go forward and look at these in detail. And also Guido Frank, who was here before, is going to be joining us in July. He's coming back here as a professor, and he has his own portfolio of, of grants. So we're looking forward to great things in the future. Now, the one thing I really want to talk about here is, this is going to be a little bit different, is is treatment and and clinical um, you know clinical uh, applications of this. Uh, when we started this program, our main treatment that we really were applying was family-based treatment. Now, what family-based treatment does is the old-fashioned way of treating anorexia was parentectomy. You say to the parents, "You're bad parents. We're going to take your kid. We're going to put him in the hospital. We're going to gain weight." And the, kid, the child goes home, and of course, they relapse. Seventy-five percent or more relapse because the parents have learned nothing about you know, managing these kids. So, what family-based treatment does is it provides a system of parents understanding what's going on in kids with anorexia and how to manage them at home. And um, We've moved on beyond that, so we're adding on, what we're adding on is now a skills-based kind of treatment. Uh, how people can identify their emotions, how they can learn compensatory strategies, how they can practice this so they actually have skills before they go home. And we focus on things like anxiety and risk and change and uncertainty. We've started with dialectic behavioral therapy and now we've added on a psychosocial component as well as temperament-based treatment. And I've just added the names of some of the, uh, uh, the faculty and fellows that I work with because this is really a, a collaborative effort. You know, I can say to them, as a researcher, God, this is what I think is going on, but we need talented clinicians and talented clinical researchers who can translate this into treatment approaches. So to just give you kind of a very rough estimate, well, how do we do this? Well, this is a group of people that, you know, is very sensitive to kind of rejection, punishment. They're not sensitive to reward. You can't re use reward very well to kind of manage them. They're actually, you can use, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, punishment in a very kind of judicious way, you know, in terms of things that might happen if, if they don't eat. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, that we're, that we're using with this is we know that high structure reduces anxiety, and, and so we teach the family how to kind of develop a structure at home that actually tries to kind of manage their anxiety. The other thing that this is leading to is a new uh, use of, of medication, or at least being able to target medication. Uh, so, for example, uh, the ventral uh, caudoputamin uh, uh, caudal is particularly high in dopamine D2 receptors, and so we've been looking at D2 drugs that actually might, like aripiprazole, which seems to work fairly well in at least a subgroup of people uh, in terms of reducing anxiety and increasing eating behavior. The bottom line is here, can we prove this? And so um, we've, we've looked at our first, I think, 230 uh, people that were in the adult program, and we just asked the question, if you're an anorexic or restrictor or a bulimic anorexic, we, you know, do you gain weight at the end of treatment? Yes, of course you do. But can you maintain that weight a, a year after your discharge? And our data is, yes, a substantial portion of these people are able to maintain their weight, suggesting that we're actually starting to be able to kind of turn this turn this illness around. The other thing is that I want to say something very briefly about what's going on in the eating disorder field. 
80% or more of the treatment now is delivered by private programs that are owned by private equity companies. Um, and uh, uh, they're very profitable for these companies. That's why they're in the business. And one of the things that's happening is that university programs are going out of business because of that. We just can't compete. Uh, we're one of the few programs actually in the country that has actually flourished over the last decade. And the reason that we flourished is that we really you know, use the scientific basis of treatment uh, of, of understanding the brain uh, to integrate that with, with treatment and treatment delivery. And, uh, you know, I think these have been a phenomenal group of talks that I've heard over the last day or two. And one of the things that occurs to me is like, you folks have got great insights into psychopathology and treatment approaches. Why aren't we taking this into the clinic? Um, just to give you an idea of how our, our program has grown, we've grown about 20% a year. Uh, we now treat, uh, in IOP and day treatment, we treat 120,000 hours of patients a year. Um, and this is a, you know, as, as Mark says, this is a profitable kind of program. I think this is possible to do in other areas too, and I really encourage you. Grant money is really hard to get. You know, you generate, in a way, you can generate a lot more money doing clinical care than you can ever do. Uh, writing grants unless you're Igor. So. So, so I just want to end by saying that, uh, uh, you know, I really want to acknowledge and thank uh, all my colleagues and collaborators that I've worked with um, and, uh, you know, people like uh, Martin who have been so helpful in, in developing these studies as well as Amanda and Christine and, and, uh, and Guido and others. Uh, so, I, you know, I want to thank you and I also want to just end by uh, just kind of saying this is our staff now. We have more than 100 uh, uh, faculty and, and clinicians that are treating these patients. So it's possible to really have a successful program. So thank you. Super. Uh, wonderful program. Uh, I love your question. Why aren't the rest of us taking our findings in our areas and turning it into something that can generate money both to support our research if that's what we want to do as well as uh, do a service for the community. Uh, that's happening a bit in the alcohol and drugs where uh, for the first time um, we have opened uh, and, uh, a uh, treatment program basically that's on a pay basis, uh, that's alcohol or drug related, and um, we should be playing it up more and should be doing those kinds of things uh, in a much greater frequency. So that